Tonight, Russia's bloody siege. This is shameful. Now targeting civilians, thousands of casualties in a relentless bombardment of major Ukrainian cities. This is barbaric and brutal to the level of unbelievable. Plus, don't spoil the Olympics. China's role in pushing Russia to hold off on invading Ukraine until after the Beijing Winter Games. And reopening old wounds. He thumped me right between the eyes and almost knocked me out. The national investigation into a Montana boarding school for Native Americans. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. A turn of the tide as Russia captures its first major city in Ukraine. Welcome to Faith Nation in Washington. I'm Jenna Browder. Tonight, the Russian military has gained control of a strategic port city of Kherson. This, as the U.N. says, more than a million people have fled Ukraine in just one week of fighting. Still, the people of Ukraine are resisting Russian troops despite the 40-mile convoy on its way to the capital city of Kyiv. CBN's Brody Carter is following the crisis and joins us with more. Brody? Jenna, word of a top Russian general killed by a Ukrainian sniper is boosting morale among fighters in Kyiv. Ukraine reports some 9,000 of Putin's troops have died during their own invasion. But Moscow's war machine persists in targeting civilians. These aren't military targets. They are places where civilians work and families live. Ukrainian officials are reporting more than 2,000 casualties as Russian troops target the homes of innocent civilians with nonstop shelling in a handful of cities. Moscow troops are advancing in the south, recently taking control of Kherson, with four others surrounded. The military push would give Russia valuable access to the Black Sea. Meanwhile, heroic efforts in their own cities endure. Ukrainians, they're stacking sandbags and standing shoulder to shoulder in an effort to block Russian tanks from gaining access to their country's largest nuclear reactor. And Maria Pol, the shelling has destroyed access to water and electricity and is expected to fall into Russian control in the coming days. Meanwhile, the massive Russian convoy about 17 miles north of the capital, Kyiv, seems to have stalled. Michael O'Hanlon with the Brookings Institute believes the only way to avoid mass casualties in this war is for negotiations at the table. It's shaping up to be a real fight. And so that's certainly the news that we've been all wrestling with and digesting and you know, applauding the Ukrainians as they go. Unfortunately, applauding them and admiring them doesn't translate into seeing a path for them to win. As the Russian siege unfolds, the humanitarian crisis is worsening. One million people have left the country. Many more have left their homes seeking safety underground in cities further from the fighting. Fallout from that war has inflated oil prices worldwide. One barrel of oil has skyrocketed to $110. President Biden saying in his State of the Union address that he plans to release $30 million from a strategic oil reserve, but critics compare that move to putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. The U.S. is pushing ahead with a new wave of restrictions, blocking oil and gas equipment from and to Russia, sanctioning entities supporting Russia's defense sector as well. The International Criminal Court's prosecutor is investigating Russian war crimes and genocide dating back to 2013. Jenna, back to you. All right, Brody Carter for us in the newsroom. Thank you, Brody. And joining us tonight from Lviv, Ukraine, CBN News Senior International Correspondent George Thomas. Uh, George, we're hearing these reports of mass casualties uh, due to the Russian military as it continues its rampage in Ukraine. You're in Lviv in the western part of the country. What is the feeling from the people there you're with? Uh, uh, yeah, they're all eyes and hearts are focused on how to help the uh, Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who are flocking uh, to places like here in the western part of the country, you know, offices, uh, schools, colleges, uh, uh, people's workplaces, restaurants, uh, gymnasiums, you name it, have all been turned into, uh, in essence, shelter for people. They're all focused on that. They're getting uh, essential aid, uh, uh, critical supplies, water, food, uh, diapers, uh, medicine, all of those things. Their focus is on that. They're trying not to uh, listen to the news, watch the news, obviously, in all around them. But they're all focused on helping those who are fleeing and potentially helping military personnel who might need assistance as well in the days and weeks ahead. 
The International Criminal Court is investigating Russia for war crimes and genocide in Ukraine. Um, President Biden, he was asked about it yesterday, if, if there are war crimes being committed, in fact. And he said that they're just monitoring the situation. You know, many of these images that we're seeing and the stories that we're hearing, George, really do seem to speak for themselves. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, the British Prime Minister said uh, pretty much to, to that extent, he said that uh, uh, Vladimir Putin is guilty of war crimes. The, uh, the chief prosecutor for the International Criminal Court has brought up has opened up an investigation looking at this particular uh, issue. You know, there, there, there are very specific guidelines when it comes to charging somebody with war crimes. And was, one of the items is, you know, w uh, did a military or a commander take action against a civilian target, against a target that had civilians, that there was no, uh, no presence of military troops uh, in the situation? And according to Ukraine's mm -hmm. President Zelensky and others who are on the ground, they say that uh, the Russians have been carrying out uh, indiscriminate attacks are specifically targeted uh, toward civilian uh, 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 areas. And, and, you know, I think part of it, you see the frustration in the beginning, they went after military targets, and now they seem like they're not making much progress. And the accusation is that they are now targeting civilians. Yeah. Uh, you know, the war in Ukraine is, is a huge humanitarian crisis. One million people fleeing so far. George, will more people continue to flee, or is that window closing in on them? Oh, no, absolutely not. I've been, uh, we, you know, all throughout the, the time that I've been here, I've, I've been talking to people who are constantly on the phone. They have drivers who are ready to shuttle uh, to Kiev and to the eastern part of the country. There's a network of people talking to each other and getting ready to try to help, try to ferry people out. I was on the phone with somebody who was in Kharkiv, a mother and three children. And desperately crying, trying to say, can you get me out? Can you get me out? And suddenly somebody else gets on the phone, makes a call, and was able to get a car to them. And three days later, they are now here in Lviv on their way to Poland. Uh, there's a network of people working either on WhatsApp, on Telegram, really across the, the country, trying to rescue, trying to evacuate people uh, from these hotspots uh, in the south as well as in the eastern part of the country. Yeah, it's been inspiring to see just the world um, and communities all over uh, rallying behind the Ukrainian people. George Thomas Force in Ukraine, Lviv. George, thank you so much. Stay safe. Thank you. Appreciate it. And we should mention happening this weekend, a live prayer, a prayer event with George and a Ukrainian pastor. This Saturday, March 5th at 11 a.m. Eastern. If you'd like to participate, you do need to sign up. You can do that by going to cbn.com slash pray for Ukraine. In other news tonight, the Federal Reserve is sticking with its plan to roll out a series of interest rate hikes starting this month. Chairman Jerome Powell relaying that message to lawmakers today. I do think it will be appropriate to raise our target range for the federal funds rate at the March meeting in a couple of weeks, and I'm inclined to propose and support a 25 basis point rate hike. Powell warning the economic impact of war in Ukraine and global sanctions against Russia make things highly uncertain, adding that it's too soon to predict how they could affect the Fed's policies. But for now, they will stay the course. Well, the committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol says it has evidence former President Trump and some of his associates illegally tried to obstruct Congress's count of electoral votes. The committee also believes Trump attorney John Eastman may have violated the law by trying to block investigators from obtaining emails related to the investigation. Trump responding to the findings saying the actual conspiracy to defraud the United States was the Democrats' rigged election and the fake news media and the unselect committee covering it up. Few things could be more fraudulent or met with more irregularities. Meanwhile, Joshua James, a member of the extremist group Oath Keepers who participated in the January 6th attack, is, uh, is the first to plead guilty to seditious conspiracy if convicted, he faces up to 20 years in prison. The White House is releasing a new COVID-19 preparedness plan, unveiling a new strategy to fight the pandemic. Goals include preventing and treating COVID by making testing and medications more available and avoiding shutdowns by providing tools for businesses and schools to improve ventilation and filtration systems. Much of the plan requires funding from Congress and could cost up to $30 billion. 
Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is under fire tonight after asking a group of high school students to take off their face masks during a news conference. You do not have to wear those masks. I mean, please take them off. <laughs> Honestly, it's not doing anything, and we got to stop with this COVID theater. So if you want to wear it, fine, but this is, a, this is ridiculous. DeSantis' objection to mask and vaccine mandates has drawn national attention. A USA Today analysis based on statistics from Johns Hopkins shows the state ranking 31st on a list of where coronavirus has spread the fastest. DeSantis is running for re-election and is considered a possible 2024 presidential candidate. A new report exposing the depth of Russia's relationship with China. Coming up, China's role in the timing of the Kremlin's invasion of Ukraine. Welcome back. Tonight, new revelations over China's role in the Russian invasion of Ukraine blows open the depths of China's relationship with Russia. According to a report in the New York Times, the Chinese communist regime urged Russia to hold off its invasion of Ukraine until after the Beijing Olympics. The Times reporting Chinese officials had direct knowledge about Vladimir Putin's war plans. And here with us now is author, columnist and speaker Gordon Chang. Gordon, welcome. Great to have you with us this evening. Uh, that is a pretty stunning revelation that China knew all along about Russia's war plans. Yes, and, and, and I think that it certainly is credible because, remember, Vladimir Putin went to uh, Beijing February 4th, met for more than two and a half hours with Xi Jinping. They issued that 5,000-word communique that talked about their no-limits partnership. And since then, you know, we have seen um, all of these announcements of commodity deals. So on February 4th, there was the announcement of the $117.5 billion in new oil and gas deals. There was the 100 million metric tons of Russian coal. Uh, China has lifted restrictions on the importation of Russian wheat. The list goes on and on. And so China is directly financially supporting this invasion. And clearly the Chinese did not want an invasion during their big show, the Olympics. And, and Vladimir Putin waited four days until after the event. Yeah. Uh, a group of Chinese aircraft entered Taiwan's defense zone in the immediate confusion of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Gordon, is China watching the U.S. response to Russia here to test how its invasion of Taiwan might go over? Certainly. Um, China watches everything that the United States does. This was painfully clear as Afghanistan fell, and China is watching what the United States has done. And, and here, Jenna, the thing that is really most disturbing is that although the United States is far stronger than Russia, um, Russia decided to invade anyway. This was a complete failure of American deterrence. And it was not just the United States, it was uh, Europe as well. So um, China's looking at this and saying, well, you know, the Biden administration doesn't have will. There are also some good signs, though, in that uh, belatedly uh, Biden has rallied a European opinion. They've seen the sanctions. Those sanctions might work. And the other thing that Beijing is taking away from all of this is the Ukrainian people fighting back. That's not something that Beijing expected. And they can expect the people in Taiwan to fight back if there's an invasion of their island. Yeah. Um, China is finally now stepping away from Russia, calling the invasion of, of Ukraine an actual war um, and offering to play a role in a ceasefire agreement with Ukraine. Um, Gordon, is this uh, is this China trying to save face here? I, I think that um, Beijing is, is going to continue to financially support the invasion. Um, China may make rhetorical concessions because it can see that the invasion is not proceeding as planned. Um, but uh, I don't think that you're going to see Xi Jinping step away from Vladimir Putin unless he absolutely has to. There are a lot of reports of mid to low level officials in China who are aghast at China's support for Putin, who think it's not in China's interest. And I think that those lower level officials are right, but they don't count. There's only one person who counts right now, and that's Xi Jinping. And he's fully backing Vladimir Putin. Yeah. Um, a new report from India uh, to suggest the Chinese uh, suggest Chinese made military components are stalling Russian progress in Ukraine. What do you make of that, Gordon? I think that that's right. Um, we know that China makes shoddy products and you add that to Chinese and Russian corruption. 
And so the tires and components of these Russian vehicles are not working. And, and the important lesson here is that we should be getting Chinese components out of our weapons, out of our infrastructure, and out of our networks, because we have the same problem that Russia does. All right, uh, Gordon Chang, it's always good to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your expertise. Thank you, Jenna. And still ahead, hundreds of unmarked graves at a Native American boarding school. What we know and the national investigation that's underway. Two hundred unmarked graves. They were discovered last year at, in, a, in Canada at a Native American boarding school. The discovery prompting the United States Secretary of the Interior to launch a national investigation. Mark Martin traveled to Montana to explore this tragedy that's an issue on both sides of the border. When he was a child, Blackfeet Nation member Wes Bremner attended the Cutbank Boarding School in northwestern Montana. As a second grader in the 60s, distance and harsh winters made it a necessity. The school environment proved harsh as well. Bremner says physical abuse started on day one when a staff member punched him. He thumped me right between the eyes and almost knocked me out. And I went against the wall, just kind of wobbly on my feet. And uh, he said, now you go to bed. And it was about this time of day. Brimner is just one of many students who say they endured harsh corporal punishment and demeaning verbal abuse at indigenous boarding schools. And some came forward years later with allegations of sexual abuse. We asked Brimner if that ever happened to him. If I was, I would take it to my grave. And why is that again? It's the past. It's not something you would, uh, It's nobody's business. The boarding school where Bremner attended is still operational today. He says it's better run and the abuse that took place when he was a student is unheard of. On the Flathead Reservation in Montana, indigenous boarding schools existed alongside St. Ignatius Mission. The Jesuit priest and pastor, Father Craig Hightower, says abuse happened at these schools as well. There was some sexual abuse, there's no question about it. Um, and that's already been litigated in court. Uh, the majority of the abuses were uh, trying to take away their culture, uh, trying to assimilate them into the white world, uh, and the corporal punishment of the day. The, I mean, just the corporal punishment that was common at that time. All that is left of the original Ursuline Academy are the remains of this grotto that held a statue of Mary. Children ages preschool to high school gathered in a building that once stood on this property. Was it worse with the priests and the nuns? Maybe, maybe not, but that, those were the big controversies of, uh, of kids, you know, really being be beaten and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, that was part of the culture overall. According to the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, more than 350 U.S. government-funded and many times church-run boarding schools operated in the 19th and 20th centuries. The movement started under the Indian Civilization Act of 1819 with the goal of assimilating indigenous children. Bremner says his mother was one of thousands of kids taken from their communities. He says at her school there was a sign that read, kill the culture, save the child. Montana State Representative Sharon Stewart Paragoy says while Crow tribe children weren't forcibly taken, the goal remained the same. Children weren't allowed to speak the language. Um, that was, and um, part of it was the hair was cut especially with the boys uh, and the girls, their, their hair was cut, and then they were forced to move into the, the modern dress. The 2021 discovery of more than 200 unmarked graves at an Indian boarding school in Canada led Deb Holland, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, to launch a national investigation, the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. Holland, the first Native American cabinet secretary, says her eight-year-old grandparents were taken from their families. She hopes the investigation will shed light on the unspoken traumas of the past. A lot of them died 
Some of them probably died from broken hearts, and a lot of them just died from being in close contact with disease that they couldn't get rid of because everybody was crammed in together. And so what we want for our children is to help them to get to reconnect to who they are and to be strong and, and to have thriving nations. That's what we hope um, Deb Howland will be able to do, is to change the policy, educational policy, to provide empowerment. It's no strange thing for Native American communities not to trust the government, but um, to, to be able to create and to heal bonds within Native American communities in county governments, state governments, and the federal government, and um, to have that conversation so that we can move forward. Mark Martin, CBN News, Montana. Send how you can help too. I am Regents first ROTC graduate student. Millennials are flocking to church. It's not an exaggeration to say that we love to meet them and that we love to know their stories. Finally tonight, Ukrainians helping Ukrainians right here in the United States. In Parma, Ohio, the Pokrova Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church is on a mission. Volunteers working round the clock to box donations for Ukraine, filling a trailer in less than a day. Things like warm clothes, non-perishable food, and medical supplies are all headed to refugees in Poland. And it's not just the Ukrainian community in Ohio that's reaching out to help. Volunteers across the world are offering their charity and goodwill in an effort to support the Ukrainian people in their fight for freedom. And that is going to do it for Faith Nation tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow.